So I am Dr. Castellanos, and I am here with our guest speakers, Brianna Rue and Dr. Glenda Aleman, which we'll be getting to hear from them uh, very, very shortly. Before we start our presentation, I always take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the chiasm and welcome everybody. I'm so excited that our network is growing. We've, um, we have about 165 optometrists just, just in Dayton Broward that have joined um, our network. Um, some of you might still not know exactly what the chiasm is. What is this chiasm? Well, there's a little, there's a lot of moving parts in the chiasm, but mainly what it is, is a referral platform. It's to control all the referrals coming in and to control the referrals going out and to keep track, know when your patient has an appointment. Did the patient go to the specialist, um, have proof of that referral for liability purposes, and then also be able to co-manage your patient. A lot of times you refer your patient and you never hear about them. So this program was created really to solve problems that optometrists have. Other doctors can use it, but it's really because we are the senders. We are the ones that our patients rely on to get them to the right person. And then we wanna see our patients back. So we wanna make sure that we refer to someone that's good for our patient, that we have a relationship with, and that we're gonna get our medical records back. So that, that's what the platform is. Um, in the directory, which you see right there, you could go ahead and search for different doctors and different specialists. Now, just because you're an optometrist doesn't mean you can't refer to another optometrist. And that's why I love that our speakers today are Dr. Glenda Aleman and Dr. Brianna Rue, because they're optometrists. And through this portal, you can refer to them and co-manage whether it's um, atropine or um, an ortho K that you're not um, comfortable with. I call them I manage, I manage, E Y E manage. So start I managing with people like Dr. Boschnik, Dr. Lise Kramer, and you could do it through this portal, portal to support your patients, to support other optometrists. Now, what is an active member? An active member is someone that attends events such as this one that you use a platform by either sending a referral, receiving referrals from PCPs, chatting um, through uh, our chat feature, which is listed below showing that um, you could communicate instead of having to pick up the phone. Um, instead of texting, you could ask questions about a patient and it's a HIPAA compliant portal. Um, also, um, I wanted to list uh, that you can invite others to join this network. Benefits is that you get to co-manage, you get to track your patients, you get to participate in these Zoom sessions, which helps us um, learn more and grow our practice. You get to also participate in our networking events, which are either virtual, like a pizza party or a chocolate tasting, or in the near future, um, in person. We are setting up vendor discounts. And right now, I'm super excited because we were approved for the Florida Online, yes, Online, sorry, Dr. Brianna Rue, it's just one credit though, in practice management, online. And you could go to thechiasm.com slash news and watch a video of me, sorry, talking about referrals um, to get one, one CE credit. You do have to do five questions, it's a worksheet, and submit that to us to get that credit. New features that we're gonna be launching, I'm so, so excited um, because I went ahead and we surveyed um, optometrists and we got your feedback and we listened and what we're doing is we're changing a lot of things and adding great features you are going to be able to at the end of this month be able to send a referral to any licensed doctor in the state of Florida e any doctor you're going to be able to send them a referral and get confirmation that they that they open the referral um, you'll be able to track all your referrals, meaning let's say you're on the directory and a patient calls through the phone and said, I was referred by um, Dr. Brianna Rue to, to your office. Your staff could then track that referral, whether it was a fax, a phone call, or a digital all in one platform. So you could really grow and focus on referrals in your practice. Also, I surveyed you guys and you wanted a vendor marketplace. So that is coming at the end of November. 
where you're going to be able to log into your account and you're going to get vendor discounts. I'm hoping Dr. Contact Lens provides a vendor discount. Um, and also we have integrations in place. So if you have a practice fusion or a system that you want to not have to type in the patient's name and date of birth because you're just don't have time or just don't want to contact me and I'll show you how to integrate. Of course, there's some limitations, but as we expand and as you guys use this platform, we will be able to then reinvest into the system to make your lives easier. Um, we are going to be having a new, a new event at the end of November or the beginning of December, which is going to be a vendor raffle to launch our vendor marketplace. And that's going to be awesome because we're going to have our vendors raffling off um, certain prizes every five minutes to any participant of our Zoom session. So I love fun ideas. I have some things coming up. Um, also, you want to grow your practice. You want to take control, like I mentioned earlier. So join to send referrals for free. You could go on, join the, join the, the as a referral, uh, as a referring doctor, and you could send as many referrals as you need through this platform and there's no charge. Now, if you're interested in sending referrals and receiving your referrals and getting organized and really, really focusing on growing your practice in that part, you know, you could schedule a demo at the chiasm.com or you could email me. Also to stay connected and to our events or um, any information that we wanna share with you, which is very, very few times, I'm not gonna go text crazy, you could text referral to 39970 and we will then um, you would be subscribed into getting our notifications. Also follow us on Facebook at the Chiasm or Instagram or LinkedIn and you could subscribe to receive our newsletter to get information about events like this. Now I'm going to go ahead and let Brianna Rue go ahead and share her screen. I think you should be able to share it. I want to say that Brianna um, Dr. Ru, oh, me, went to school together and she is an exceptional person. She is so hard, hard working and she is so smart that we could all really learn so much from her. Um, I mean, the day has 24 hours, but she finds a way to make it have 36. So I really appreciate her squeezing us into her schedule and, you know, helping us learn more about atropine. Uh, Bree, are you, Dr. Brew, are you able to share your screen? There we are. Okay. Yes, Felton, I'll be right there, bud. All right. So I'm excited to be here tonight um, and share this um, moment with Dr. Castellanos for having me and then also for um, Dr. Marie Peter Glenda. So welcome here and we'll jump right over here. Let me. All right. Okay. I did want to say one thing in the chat. If you could let us know if you own your own, um, if you're an owner, business owner, or if you are an associate, we would just love to know, um, you know, who wants to learn more about my optic control. Yes, I'm excited. This is my second lecture today. Actually, I lectured, um, gave a two hour lecture to the residents at NOVA. So it's exciting that this is starting to get out there more and more. Um, financial disclosures here, I'm on the Medical Advisory Board for OSRX. I'm also a STAR study investigator, which is to get the FDA approval for atropine. And then I'm the co-founder of Dr. Contact Lens, and Gianni is going to give me just a couple minutes to talk about that at the end. So here, 2020 was supposed to be our year of the optometrist. So I'm the past president of the Broward County Optometric Association. And when we were ringing in this new year, we were all really, really excited. However, here we are, 2020 with two months left. And this is one of my favorite memes that I have seen here. So 2020, hindsight is 2020. Yes, say hi to everybody. Hi. <laughs> all right, go say hi to daddy. Mommy's on an important call. But can you okay, please put me in the hospital? Yes, we are. Go back. No, put me in the hospital. One second, guys. I will, I will. 
I'm usually the one hiding in the bathroom. I think it's Brianna's turn to <laughs> run. There we go. Okay, so time traveler here, hindsight was 2020 was a um, message from a time traveler. And we've had hindsight is 2020 is now the brunt of the joke. So we'll jump right in here to myopia. I'm excited for all of you to be here to learn a little bit more about this and bring it to your practice. So we'll kind of keep this a uh, little quick with um, some demographic and some other things through here. But this was actually the second picture that I took on my OptoMap. So here are these minus 13s, these really, really high myopes. They have to become a thing of the past. And how we do that is treating early, intervening really early, and being really aggressive. So this patient here, she's 30 years old. And as you can see, she got really, really lucky with her demarcation lines right here. So her child is now seven years old, and we're actually treating her very aggressive to make sure that she does not end up like her mother here. So by the end of this lecture between Glenda and I, we want you to be able to look at myopia in a different light, understand that there's different treatment options available to you. And then again, on the chiasm here, that collaboration, collaboration is truly key, not only from our optometry, optometry referrals, but from ophthalmology to optometry referrals. And it also starts as little as pediatricians and everything else under the sun. So in my own clinic, 70% of my practice is myopic. And I never thought owning an optical, I would actually want to grow the amotropic side of my business. However, with myopia management, that's actually where you want to go. So a little bit about me, I was that myopic kid. So I actually got my first pair of glasses in second grade and my optometrist fit me in contacts in third grade. So I'm a huge advocate for contact lenses in kids. Um, how my parents found out that I was nearsighted is we were driving on a trip here to South Dakota. And I said, hey mom, look at that sheep over there. And she was like, uh, that's not a sheep. So we have a big problem here or my child can't see. And my parents were both myopic. And so that cow or the sheep was a cow ended up again with my first pair of glasses in the minus 250. Where I found myopia was when my son was born. So I ended up being a minus five and a half. There's my husband, Josh Passel, who's also a neuro MD. He is a minus 650 and becoming presbyopic. So if anybody wants a patient, I've got a really good one for you. Um, then we have our son Dalton, who you just met, who is four and a half. And we're watching him very, very closely um, to make sure that he does not end up like his parents. He's got a really good chance of ending up like us, as you will see here really shortly. So when I started doing, doing some research when Dalton was born, I found out how far behind the U.S. was in treating myopia. So in parts of Asia, as you can see in this picture here, these little car kids have bars that hold them with their working distance. There's also this little clip that goes on the side of their glasses that's in over 200,000 kids over there. It also gives a printout to the parents or an app that shows the parents how much outdoor time these kids are having, what their reading work or their reading distance is, if they're tilting their head, if they've been looking up close for too long, and it actually vibrates a little bit to tell them. They also have these public service announcements that are going on over there, where the one on the left-hand side here in the screen, it says, hey, you're putting my eyes at risk by making me play with your video game. And then they're really pushing forward with, they want more time on outside activities and less time on the computer games and handheld devices. Some exciting things going on in the US finally, we've got the FDA approval of the MySight lens. So if you've not gotten your MySight training, um, I definitely recommend doing the training. It's a five hour training and you can get your MySight fit set. Um, we also have some really big industry that's been in this game for a while. So you, you have the DIMS lens from Hoya, and then Essilor has their new lens actually um, here called the Stellis lens. Um, so you're seeing a lot of industry come into myopia management. We cannot pick, pick up a journal now without reading something about myopia management. Then in Asia, we also have these classrooms here. So obviously this would not work in Florida because we would just bake our kids to death. As you can see here, they've got the little fans in the upper corners there for their air conditioning obviously is not gonna cut it in the US. So we've kind of had this perfect storm going on, right? In our digital era, we've got kids that are coming out on their devices. We go shopping on devices. We go on play dates on more devices. 
If you've not watched The Social Dilemma on Netflix, I highly recommend it. Um, I almost threw my phone in the trash <laughs> after watching that. Um, when we go outside, the kids are still on their devices. When we go have dinner time, again, we're still glued. More family, social time. And then when we try to go recharge our own batteries at night, all that we're doing is recharging our devices. And so we have to be very conscious of what we're doing and what environments we're bringing on. And then to make matters even crappier, this is how we now potty train. So again, surrounded by everything. Now we've got this 2020 classroom going on. So I highly recommend when you're seeing kids talking about what's going on right now. So now that everybody's on Zoom for eight hours a day, nobody is outside. I've surveyed my kids over the last three weeks to ask them how many hours a day they're on devices. The numbers are staggering. So they're getting five minutes between each class to really just jump into the next Zoom session. They're not getting up, they're not walking around. And they also have these little cardboard boxes that as you can see here in the left hand images, which is not giving their focusing systems the ability to look out and up. So really talk to these parents about what they're doing with this homeschool situation. Obviously the incidence of myopia is on the rise. In the early 1900s, we were not myopic and it's projected by 2050 that over 62% of us will be nearsighted. So I love optometry. I think we're in a really, really good spot for optometry. And I think optometry has to be the ones to really take myopia management. Myopia management is a gift to our field. I hate all the doom and gloom. There's no reason that we have to be worrying about vision plans and whatnot here, especially if you can take in myopia management. It will change your practice. It's changed mine for the better. Um, Glenda can attest to that as well. But it really, I think we can take this by the horns. Um, there was a study here in August of 2018 in clinical ophthalmology where it said 41.9% of kids between the ages of 5 and 19 years old are nearsighted. So again, we've got a lot of kids out there to treat. Uh, I was just talking to Justin Kwan at Cooper Vision with the MySight system, and he says the average clinician sees less than one kid a week. So you have a myopia clinic, you just have to farm it a little bit because you're seeing the myopic parents. So it's just planting little seeds along the way. Here in early 2000, they published this here where 22% of the world was myopic with 2% being highly myopic or over minus five. And in 2050, 50% 50 of the world will be myopic with 10% of us being highly myopic. And you're starting to see also in the ophthalmology world, they're starting to grab a hold of this. Again, this has to be ours because they don't want these kids in their clinics. They need to be on operating, um, not handling myopia. So we've got this six-year-old kid that walks into our doors and we diagnose them as a minus two. And what we have to realize here and realize quickly together is now when we're giving kids the glasses for the first time, I actually feel really bad about it because I feel like I did this kid a disservice really, really early on in their lives. Because what we really need to be worrying about is this myopic maculopathy and the risk factors that go with myopia. So myopia we know right now is classified as a refractive error, but how do we educate our really high myopes? We educate our really high myopes because we know that it comes with problems. Retinal detachments, glaucoma, cataracts, that myopic maculopathy, we obviously are really good at looking at myopic funding. So why the big deal here is myopic maculopathy is that stretching. So you get the stretched blood vessels, that parapapillary atrophy, your posterior staphylomas, your lacquer cracks, geographic atrophy, and then obviously leading to that choroidal neovascularization, which is the detriment to our vision. Here, when we're a minus one to minus three, as you can see in this chart published by Flipcraft here, your risk factors go up substantially. So again, that's why we're always educating our really high myopes of the importance. If you have flashes and floaters, you call me. If you have symptoms of a curtain coming into your vision, right? We do all of this education on a daily basis. Take that one step further and ask about the kids. When was your kid's last eye exam? Get those kids in. That's how you build your myopia clinic without doing anything else you're sitting on a gold mine. 
So here, why does every diopter matter? Mark Bolimar and Mill Brennan published a study here where they looked at the prevalence of myopic maculopathy on 21,000 patients. They found that for every one diopter of increase was associated with a 67% increase in myopic maculopathy. And by slowing myopia by just one diopter should reduce the likelihood of developing myopic maculopathy by 40%. They also proposed here that there's three benefits of lowering a patient's level of myopia. Obviously, you have less visual disability when you're uncorrected. So as a minus 550, I'm dependent on my glasses and my contacts all the time. There's also better options and outcomes from surgical myopic correction, meaning your LASIK surgeons would prefer to do a surgery on a minus four than a minus 10. Same thing for cataract surgeons as well. So we can also have better outcomes by reducing that level of myopia. And then obviously there's a reduced risk of blindness that's associated with those higher levels of myopia. And to put this into perspective here, we all prescribe AREDs for our patients with macular degeneration or drusen. However, none of us are prescribing myopic, or myopic control or myopic man management here for our patients. But by reducing that by one diopter, we lower that risk of myopia, myopic maculopathy by 40%. So I hope by the end of this lecture, you have your aims with the other things that you can take back. So one thing to take away here is, are we really doing our kids a service by saying, here's your minus two glasses, I'll see you in a year. I would highly recommend start seeing those patients more frequently. Even if you're not going to practice myopic, or myopic management, obviously find somebody that wants to and bring them into your practice because you can build a little cash cow there but also do more of a service for your patients, knowing that that kid's gonna get worse in a year, that seven or eight year old, try to intervene. So here, I hope that you're looking at that kid just a little differently. So we know that the risk factors here are multifactorial. We've got genetics at play, that near work, outdoor time, education level or ethnicity, age of onset, and other things like prematurity, diet, and light exposure. So here's the genetic piece. When you've got one myopic parent, your kid is at a two times greater risk of developing myopia. When you've got two myopic parents, they're at a five to six times greater risk of developing myopia and being worse than the parents. Hence why I went down that rabbit hole for my son. Then we have this environmental factor here. If the kids are spending more than three hours up close and near work, and again, our kids are on these devices for eight, nine, 10 hours a day now, and less than one and a half hours outside, Beyond anything else, they're at a 2.6 times greater risk of developing myopia. So we have to get better about educating parents about the outdoor time. So again, get outside and play, it's not that hard. 40 to 80 minutes of outdoor time reduces the incidence of myopia by 23% to 50%. So when you're seeing these parents, again, bringing it up about those two, three, four, five, six-year-olds and getting them outside. Here, our kids outside, we're allowed, our, our prisoners are allowed to be outside two hours a day for yard time. There was a study here that looked at 12,000 or asked 12,000 parents how much time their kids spend outside. One third of them said less than 30 minutes a day. We can do better as a society by pushing our kids out the door. Here is a really interesting study that was published in 2008. It looked at Chinese origin kids in Sydney and Singapore, and you can see the parental myopia, very similar in both um, arms of the study. However, look at that near work. The kids in Sydney spent more hours on near work, but they spent almost four times the amount of time outside. And their myopic prevalence was 3.3% versus the kids in Singapore that were only outside three hours a week was 29.1%. So if you're not going to practice myopia management, at least start having that conversation of the outdoor time with your kids. We don't know why it works, but there's a couple of theories here. We don't know if it's the light level towards the UV end of the spectrum. There's also this value when you go outside, obviously we're looking at infinity versus when we're looking up close. The bottom image here, you can see when we're inside, there's different areas of accommodation happening on our retina. And when we're outside, we have no um, factors here that are affecting our accommodation. There's also the theory that when we go outside, our retinal cells release dopamine, which prevents the eye from growing. 
And then when we are in winter months, so it's not so much in, in Florida, because obviously we're outside around a lot of sunlight all the time, but in winter months, kids are known to progress three to four times faster. There's also this theory that's looking at the choroid. So here was a study that was published that when we look at black text on white background, which is what we look at all day, that the choroid actually thins, which then creates this axial elongation. If you're looking at reverse text, so white text on a black background, the choroid actually thickened and it actually prevented the eye from growing. So it's gonna be interesting to see as more and more studies are published. So here is that risk assessment that you can start thinking about with your kids. Those kids that are less than nine years old, when they have less plus in their refraction with at least one myopic parent, and there's that offset between the near work and the outdoor time. And then those fast progressors that you really need to watch for and not say that I'll see you in a year, maybe seeing them every three to six months, are those kids that again, you're diagnosing before the age of nine that are progressing at more than one day after a year with myopic parents. If you put this into perspective here about how we talk with parents and talk with kids, pediatricians are really good at this. They're able to tell you on a growth chart here where your kid's going to end up, right? So bragging a little bit, my kid's in the 95 percentile for height and the 50th percentile weight, he's going to be a tall, skinny little dude. Same thing happens here for myopia. So as you can see in this chart, if you diagnose a five-year-old with their first pair of glasses here, those are gonna be the kids with the longest progression. Progression happens typically between the ages of six to 13 years old, and that's getting longer and longer as we're getting on devices more and more. So every year, as you can see in this chart, that we delay the onset of myopia, the better outcomes that we're gonna have. So Mark Bolimar even made a, a, a correlation here with a lot of studies. Most of the studies that are performed you get your most treatment effect, meaning the most slowing of progression in the first year of treatment. So even if you intervene for just one year and that parent ends up dropping out, you've changed the trajectory of where that kid's myopia is gonna end up. So that's why it's important for those four, five, six, and seven-year-olds to get their exams and to start this early. Their Brian Holden vision calculator, you can sign up online. I keep this up on every single computer in my office here. It allows you to put in what the child is, what their age is and what their refractive error is. And now you can actually see where that kid's gonna end up. So here, six-year-old kid minus one is gonna end up somewhere between a minus four to a minus seven without any intervention. By controlling this, for this kid by 50% and them ending up around a minus 250 or a minus three, I reduce the risk of everything there with glaucoma, PSD, cataract, retinal detachment, and myopic neculopathy. This brings us to that axial length debate. What do you need to bring into your clinic here? Emetropia, you're supposed to be measuring here between 23 to 24 millimeters. You can literally get an axial length measurement machine for 2,900 bucks. They're not expensive, and it is a really, really fun measurement here. This is why axial length gives you that full picture. So practice, yes, you can practice myopia management without an axial length, but you're really not practicing full scope myopia, myopia management without measuring it. So here, same refraction, they almost have the same K readings, but look at the difference in their axial length. They're both 10 years old. This bottom kid is 27.25 millimeters long. So for every, the danger zone is over 26 millimeters. It increases your risk of myopic maculopathy exponentially when you go over 26 millimeters. So the bottom kid, I'm gonna be way more aggressive within my treatment than that top one. And it also helps you have that conversation with the parent of how, much, how forceful you need to be. So here, again, when you go over those 26 or 28 millimeters, this was a study that looked at 10,000 people and 25% of them were visually impaired by the age of 75. And again, when you get those really long myopes, your minus 11s, minus 12s, minus 13s, 90% of them were visually impaired by the age of 75. So again, we have to intervene really early on. Um, I'm gonna just skip here to this slide. Your cycloplegic refraction, if you do not take anything else from this lecture, please take this home with you. Start doing cycloplegic refractions. It gives you a lot of information. Six years old, they should be scoping between a plus 175 to a plus 150. If they're scoping less than that, they're already myopic. They just haven't made the turn yet. 
So this is where you need to bring your kids back more frequently. Cycloplegic in my office consists of tropicamide, 1%, two drops, five minutes apart. You do not have to cycle fully. Um, our clinics are too busy to do that. So just keep this in mind. So these are the kids that you wanna watch more closely. Independent of anything else, if you've got a six to seven year old that's scoping less than or equal to a plus 75, those are your myopes and those are the ones that you wanna watch. Um, when we're treating myopia, realize that there's no cookbook approach here. So my myopic exam, I'm just taking some family history, looking at where that kid is, and then obviously doing my cycloplegic refraction. Realize here that single vision does nothing, and at least what you can do is stop undercorrecting. Number one, when you're undercorrecting, you're doing two things. You're, the kid can't see very good, and you're actually speeding up progression. 80% of practitioners acknowledge that single vision glasses do nothing, yet 64% of myopic kids around the world are treated with a single vision option. So we can do better as a community. Um, spectacles, again, don't really do very much because what we're doing with spectacle correction, if you're doing a progressive, just think about it optically, right? We're wanting to create this image cell or this myopic defocus in front of the retina. If you're only giving a bifocal or a progressive that has that much area in the bottom, here, I have a really bad drawing here, but what you're seeing here is you're only maybe getting 10 to 15% of that retina that has those images that we need versus something like the Hoya DIMS lens, which is not available in the US, is giving you 360 degrees. So some myopia, myopia lens options, these are not available in the US here, but you're gonna start to see things come at all. Um, hopefully getting really good here. So the five pillars of myopia management here, we have our low dose apatine, soft multifocals here, and let me just finish up here in one more minute here. Um, atropine, it's really easy to prescribe. You can start it in kids as young as three years old. What we think is happening with, my, with atropine is remember, it's very diluted. You're taking 100 drops of saline with one drop of atropine to get 0.01%, okay? It does not work by blocking accommodation. What we think is happening is it's binding to the scleral, or the scleral receptors or the acetylcholinergic receptors in the sclera to prevent the sclera from elongating. So again, we don't really know quite what's happening there, but again, you can prescribe this as young as three years old. That's what the STAR study is enrolling. It's one drop at bedtime. Um, and then what you're doing is you're seeing kids um, at a four week follow-up, and then I see them at three months. Think of atropine when you're treating your kids with atropine, that you're, they're your glaucoma patients. So you're gonna make sure that number one, they get their drops, that's what that four week follow-up is. And then you're gonna see, ensure that they're doing treatment and that there's no side effects. I now start kids at 0.025%, knowing what I know now with all of the studies that are out there, 0.01% um, kind of can be used prophylactically if you've got those early, early myopes that haven't made the turn yet. And again, atropine, the concentration debate, we don't really know which one is better, but with our irises, especially in the US, we don't have that much melanin. And so you start to get side effects at 0.05%. We do not have that, um, the society that makes kids suffer. And so if you have any kids that are having um, side effects, they're gonna become non-compliant. And here with atropine, remember that it doesn't, it's not additive. So 0.025% lasts in the system for about 14 to 16 hours. That's why we're dosing it nightly. So it's not adding on. 0.05% lasts that 18 to 20 hours. And so that one does start to compound a little bit, but 0.01% only remains in the system for about 12 to 13 hours. Tapering this is really important. Um, you wanna start a taper here as, as long as the kid is um, not progressing for at least two years or until you can get them into another option. And then just like a steroid, you're gonna taper your atropine. At this point, it's about a six month taper. We still don't know how long that taper should be. So every other day for a month, every two days for a month, and you can go from there. Um, some soft multifocal lens options that you've got on the market are obviously your natural view multifocals. So we're creating again, that myopic defocus or that red ring in front of the retina here. We don't want any images here except right on the macula behind the retina. 
So the MySight lens is obviously here. It was done in a three-year study that showed that the cyclopegic spherical refraction slowed progression by 59% and axial length by 52%. And then how do, I'm gonna let Glenda actually jump into here on how to co-manage. Um, and then Gianni, do you want me to talk about DCL right now or later? You can go ahead and talk about it right now. That's fine. If, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just have like two minutes. Um, okay. So jumping over here, so this is my other passion, <laughs> is myobia management and Dr. Contact Lens. So you may or may not heard of my company here. I co-founded it with my um, another optometrist, Jennifer Tabiza. Um, what we found is what we wanted was some easy way for patients to order from us that was convenient, that was built from the staff perspective and the patient perspective. So. If you guys all do this, if you have a thousand contact lens patients in your office, 30% of those patients will not reorder from us because we do not make it easy or convenient. So we have $50,000 leaking out of our practices. 25% of our patients are non-compliant where they're coming back every 18 to 24 months. We obviously want them to come back every 12. And then here's the big one that is coming at us here is walking prescriptions. We all know that visceral reaction when the patient asks for a copy of their prescription, we just wanna jam that four-opter in their face. We allow you now to fight back. And so how we do that, there's this new FTC compliance rule coming at us that goes into effect tomorrow. So you either have to sign that you gave the patient a copy of their prescription before they're leaving and scan that and keep that on file for three years, or you can join Dr. Contact Lens and beat them at their own game. All you're doing is clicking a little button that you're FTC compliant. You're inviting the patient and giving them a copy of their digital prescription and it's inside your contact lens store so patients can now order from you. So we really, really wanna fight back and we're giving 1-800 um, the chance here to take our patients because we're the first ones to lose it. So again, with COVID here, we've seen a huge uptick in people using Dr. Contact Lens because they realize that when we were all closed, we did not give patients the ability to order from us. So obviously COVID really woke some of us up. How it works, patient sees you for their eye exam, your prescription automatically uploads into the doctor contact lens system. You can also enter it manually. We send the patient a link, your office does. Patients can log in and then you make the profit from the sale. Patients log in as easily as putting in a password. It's both HIPAA compliant and PCI compliant. And it's a whole smart web app that does a lot of things to give you this visceral level or this visceral look into your contact lens practice. Um, the chiasm special here, um, this will run through next Friday. Normally it's a $249 um, per month. Um, if you sign up by next Friday, we'll give you $199 for six months. And then there's a $549 startup fee. So that's Dr. Contact Lens. You can learn more at drcontactlens.com backslash doctors. And I'll now turn it over to Glenda. Are there any questions so, that I need to answer? What we're going to do is we're going to go with uh, Dr. Glenda and then after nine o'clock um, we probably will go over a little bit and if anybody needs to go hang out with their family their kids they can or if they want to stay connected and just um, you know hear the presentation they can but we're after that time we're also going to open it up for questions so if you have a private practice if you are an uh, associate or even if you're in a commercial entity uh, walmart like glenda or um uh, what is it, or like a four eyes or anything like that and you have any questions on how we deal with patients um, all three of us deal with myopic control and some more than others um so th there it's great to know how doctors do it in South Florida with our patient base. So I know everybody has a lot of things to do, but if you stay, we're gonna have like an open discussion where you could ask any questions. Um, now I wanna go ahead and thank you, by the way, Dr. Brianna. I think that uh, that lecture was very nice. I know you sped at the end so that everybody um, <laughs> you know, uh, could get through this faster. But I think that it's great that you're discussing um, atropine and myopic control because when we went to school, just a few years ago, because we're still young, we didn't have the opportunity to really learn about this. Um, and now it's something that I think if you don't know about it, 
you're going to be left behind. Um, so that brings me to, oh, and thank you, by the way, for that chiasm special. I think that your system is great. And um, I think it's awesome that you're also helping other optometrists solve a problem and bring an awesome, pro uh, awesome product to their practice for, you know, a discounted rate because they're part of this network. So thank you. I really do appreciate that support. Um, now going to Dr. Glenda, um, I want to say, let me tell you, I might not have known you as long as Brie, but the passion that you have and the knowledge and the assistance that you've provided me has been amazing. Um, you know, I know that you graduated after me, but it's incredible how since we've met, we've been able to lean on each other for different things. And this is one of the things that I started doing and I went to school to do ortho K, but you know, the roads took me in a different way. And I do with a lot of pediatrics and geriatrics. And now that I am opening the doors to myopic control and atropine and ortho K, I have to sometimes call my friends and associates. And I'm glad to have that, that circle and that support. So Glenda, go ahead, please, and present your uh, presentation and share your, your knowledge with all of us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yanni. Uh, so you want me to share my slides? Yes, because okay. I didn't update the ones that you can. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, um, so everybody can see my slides? Hello. Yes, we can, because we're, we're muted, sorry. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, so first of all, I just wanna say uh, thank you, Brianna, for that amazing lead in. You know, you, uh, I mean, you did an amazing job and, um, you know, so it makes it a lot easier for me to just talk about my presentation. So just a little bit about me, like Gianni said, um, I actually graduated very recently, just in 2017. Um, but when I was going through optometry school, I realized that I really enjoy working with children and, um, you know, since I have to work with children, of course, myopia is so prevalent in uh, the pediatric community that I realized very shortly that I had to become um, a myopia control expert. And I was very fortunate that when I graduated optometry school, my first job was um, in a primary care practice who had an emphasis in pediatric and was doing ortho K. So I was, um, I had basically like a paid residency because I had to go into the practice and start doing ortho K right away as soon as I graduated um, optometry school. So this right here is one of my patients. Um, I actually have, I'm very lucky to be in Miami because I get international patients. So this little girl right here, she's actually from Nicaragua and uh, she's uh, very special because it was my first challenge case she has like minus three diopters of astigmatism. And, you know, I was like, I'm, we're gonna try, but I'm not sure um, if we're gonna get down to Plano. And I was actually able to correct her all the way to, to Plano. I have to tell you that my slides are not as colorful and interactive as Brianna because um, <laughs> I'm just, that's not my strength. So I will be talking to you mostly. They're not very, there's not a lot of pictures on my slides, but um, I do talk and you can hopefully see my passion through the screen. So um, Brianna did a wonderful job. She already gave you the background knowledge on myopia. She talked about the different treatments that we have. And what I want to present to you and talk to you about is when do you treat myopia when do you want to refer that patient to, you know, someone who has more experience like Brianna? Um, so for example, you, not everything is for everyone. So you might not feel that um, doing myopia control is for you. Maybe you don't believe in it. Maybe you are passionate about ocular disease or you just have other interests. But like Brianna said, we really need to take care of our patients and do the best for them. So if myopia control is not something that you wanna do, you know, the best thing that you can do is to refer that patient to someone that can, just like we would refer to an ophthalmologist. We would refer someone for LASIK or for cataract or someone for glaucoma. I personally don't like glaucoma, so I'd rather refer those patients to someone who's passionate about that. So when to treat myopia, uh, as Brianna said, when you have a pediatric patient who has very low myopia, 
And um, I would say when they're six to seven years old and they are at least plus one, that's when I start having the conversation. So I think that you don't have to jump in necessarily and start doing ortho K right away, but having that initial conversation, it's really key. So you have a pediatric patient who's a plus one and they're about six to seven years old or eight years old, that's when I start talking to them. I start talking to the parents and telling them, okay, he's here. And I actually draw a number line and I tell them, I explain to them, okay, so he's here. It is projected that he's gonna change this much. So um, that's then you can start by doing the education. You can start talking to them about reducing the screen time, which the parents are gonna love you for it. Every time I said, you have to decrease how much time you're spending on the phone and in the screens, the parent goes like, thank you. You hear the doctor, so they're going to love you for that. That's gonna, you know, they're gonna wanna bring everyone to you. Um, next, you want to, you know, if you're starting out with doing myopia control and maybe you are starting out slowly, you're gonna start with atropine and with soft daily multifocals. So you wanna start with patients who are progressing traditionally, which is we normally expect minus um, half diopter of myopia progression in a year. So those patients would be the ones that, you know, they're your traditional myopic patient. They're not high risk. So you can start with them, start with a low dose atropine. I, uh, like Brianna, I'm using currently in my office 0 0.025. I'm not, when I started like three years ago, I started using the 0 0.01. And then we learned that that's not really effective. It's more like a placebo effect. So I switched to 0 0.025. Um, I haven't had any patients complain or have no issues, no side effects with that dosage. Um, another important thing is that you may want to do myopia control, but you need to make sure that that patient and the parents are receptive to what you're saying. So you might be talking all day and all night. Me, I get very passionate and I get carried away. But you need to be reading the patient and the parents and you know, read their body language and see if they're actually interested. At the end, we do have to do our job and that is to educate them and give them all the options. So I will, but you need to have the patient and the parents that are going to be motivated because you wanna sell them, you, know, you, you wanna do the myopia control, you, you're selling them the drops, but if they're not using them or they're not highly motivated, they might just say, okay, we'll do it. And then you never see them again. So you have to make sure that both the parent and the patient are motivated. Um, now also, again, if you are doing atropine and you're doing the soft daily disposables, whether you're doing my site or you're doing um, natural view, you want to make sure that you are treating patients that are within your comfort zone. So um, I know I work a lot with Gianni and she does ortho K, but she doesn't when she has a really high case of myopia, she sends them to me. So I've, I've talked to a lot of doctors who are actively doing ortho-K and maybe they have really busy and active practices in ortho-K, but they don't really feel comfortable doing anything over minus five. So, you know, make sure that you're doing something that you're comfortable with, something that fits your practice and it fits your personality. And if you don't feel comfortable doing something, um, you know, over minus five, minus six, there are, you know, more experienced ortho-K fitters that would be happy to see those patients and they're, you know, it's actually very effective and we can get those patients all the way down to Plano. Um, when I started treating those patients, I actually thought that I wouldn't be able to get them down to Plano. So I always talked to the parents and I was like, we might have residual myopia, but there's actually wonderful lenses out there that will correct those patients all the way um, down. I want to say I was scared. I was scared to refer to another optometrist, especially because I just met her. I was scared of losing my patient and, you know, something going wrong. Um, and I went ahead and I said, you know what? It's the right thing to do. I don't do ortho K for a minus eight. I don't have, the, I really don't have the experience and I don't have the time, um, you know, because I'm in so many places. And I went ahead and took a leap of faith. And that patient was so grateful to me. Um, and to Dr. Glenda, they came back and they thanked me and they came back and we co-managed together and I went ahead and did a few of the follow-ups. So sometimes we have to know what our comfort zone is and, and really build relationships with others to know that we could trust them to give our patient the right care and know that that patient will be ours now. That's right. Thank you, Gianni. 
Um, so yeah, so when you refer a patient to me, um, you know, the patients, like you're their hero. They come to me and I treat them, but they're like, oh my God, I love Dr. Gianni. Or um, I have Shannon here, another doctor that refers to me. And they're like, oh my God, I love Dr. Shannon. Oh, she's so sweet. And they're like, she's my angel. You know, that's, um, that was, I'm quoting a patient that Shannon referred to me for um, scleral lenses. So they, you really, really, they really appreciate when you do that. Um, so here, I'm just going to go briefly on the myopia control methods because Brianna did an amazing job already talking about this. So, um, of course, we know atropine. What is the right dosage? So we really should be using 0 0.02 to 0 0.03. Um, I do have a few patients that are very um, high-risk myopic patients. So I do have them in a 0 0.05, and they are doing okay. I, you know, once... I know that I'm gonna be using a higher dosage. I kind of foresee what are gonna be the side effects. So I'm already preparing to mitigate for the side effects. So I put them on transitions, I put them on progressives, and I really have no issues with those patients. Um, okay, what is, um, when do you start treatment education? Again, like we said, six to seven years old. To me, I start talking to them if they're plus one and lower and like myopic, I started having the conversation with them. So even if I know, if I see that they're not going to jump in and do myopia control that day, when they come back the next year, I said, okay, so I see here, you know, he, he progressed just like we predicted. And now here's where we are. And they said, yes, I do remember. And a lot of those patients, you're going to see that they're going to convert to, you know, start myopia control treatments in their second year and their third year. So that's how I've been growing my practice. I, in the beginning, I didn't have any referrals. All my patients were from within my practice and I don't see a lot of kids in my practice, but unfortunately a lot of the kids that I do see have myopia and they have really, really high myopia. So the schedules I do very similar to um, Brianna and this differs differently between myopia control experts. Um, I see the patients every three months. So once I start, first I do the exam, then I schedule a myopia control consultation, which is very important that you do that because you want to um, have their full attention, let them think about it and come back with questions for you. And then when I do the, the consultation, that's when we decide what treatment we're gonna go with. And at that point, we start treatment, we order their drops, I start them on their drops and I see them every three months. And you will be surprised because Sometimes I might forget, but my patients who are in myopia control, they come back. I go to my waiting area and I'm like, what are they doing here? And they're like, oh yeah, they're here for the three months. So they're very, very loyal. They are very compliant. I really haven't had any issues of patients not returning. I might have maybe two or three patients that um, have not come back. Other than that, they're very, very um, good coming back to their appointments. I really don't have an issue. And even if they're like a plus one, plus 125, I have them come back in six months. They come back for those appointments. So I think it's, they really trust you when you talk, you take your time to educate the parents. They're really gonna listen to you because they really appreciate that you went that extra step and you're taking the time to talk to them about myopia control. And just by you having that conversation, they see you as you're different than the other doctors. You know, a lot of the times they'll tell me, why my other doctor never told me this? How come they had never mentioned it to me? So like Gianni said, if you're not having these conversations with your patients, you're gonna stay behind. And when they go to somebody who is going to take the time and talk to them about, my, about myopia control, that's when you're probably gonna lose a patient. So it's very important that we are having those conversations and we are at least at a very minimum educating the patients. So ortho -K, my favorite. Um, so I do a lot of ortho -K. Uh, When I present, I always present all three options to the patients. Of course, if I have very young patients, my youngest ortho -K is eight years old. So uh, usually if they're five to seven, I start them with atropine. I start preparing them and saying, we're gonna start with atropine and you know we're gonna revisit next year and see where he is or she is. And then we'll probably wanna start doing ortho-K in a couple of years. So um, ortho-K, the most important thing I think with ortho-K, and you're gonna be very successful, is that you need to have a motivated 
patient and parents, of course, because this is, I tell um, the parents that this is a whole family effort, you know, because either the dad, the mom, they have to coordinate to bring these kids to their, their appointments. And some of these patients, like, like I said, I do a lot of high myopia, so I have to see them more often than a, you know, a minus three. That one is like a one to three and they're done. And I just see them under regular schedule visits, uh, your traditional ortho K follow-up schedule. But when they have those higher myopias or a lot of astigmatism, I do have to see them quite more often. So you need to you know, be upfront with the parents and say, this is what it's gonna take. Would you have the time? Is this gonna be okay? So if the parents, you know, like they, they are motivated, some parents would say, is there anything else that we can do? Because maybe I don't have the time to come in. So I think that that is the most important factor in you being successful with Ortoke is that you wanna have a motivated patient and a motivated parent as well. The way that I start my conversation with the patient is that I ask them, okay, so you know, we did your exam today, here is your prescription. Do you like wearing glasses? Most kids that are gonna be like, they don't say no, they'll just check their head. So I'm like, okay, well, you know, guess what? We have other options. Maybe you don't have to wear glasses. And then I show them the video of, um, you know, like it would be great to show you here the demonstration, but I show them the video from the um, American Academy of Ortho K and Myopia Control. And I say, well, you know, we have this treatment option and I present it to, to them and they usually, you know, they get very excited about it. I think, um, you know, they usually react very surprised. They think it's fascinating and showing them uh, visuals, it's very, very good to get them engaged. Another question that I ask them is, do you play any sports? Do you like to do any activities outdoors? So usually, you know, they're gonna say, well, I like to play this or I play that. Um, a lot of kids have extracurriculum activities now and they're playing sports. And even it went down a little bit with COVID, but they are back out doing sports, so that's great. So when they tell me they play sport, that's another great point where, you know, I, I pick it back of that and I say, well, you know, when you're playing, uh, whether it's football or hockey or uh, swimming is a big one, um, you know, that's a great lead way for you to start the conversation about ortho K because, you know, it's amazing. I had patients come back and tell me, oh my God, like everybody on the team is asking me like, what happened? Like you're the best goalie now because, you know, since they started doing ortho K, they're more confident. So, um, so that's a great point to start the conversation about ortho K. Now, let's say you start doing ortho K, um, you know, you're great and you're just starting out. You really want to set yourself up for success. So I have a lot of colleagues that call me and ask me questions all the time. And sometimes they have, you know, they just did one case of ortho K. And then the next thing you know is that they have a minus 10, they wax into the door. And they're like, what do I do? And I said, you know, I really don't think that's a good idea for you to do this right now because, you know, a minus 10, it is a more complicated case. Um, Brianna can attest for that. That's gonna require for you to have, first of all, you need to have a topographer and you know, it's, you're not gonna do that with a Paragon CRT lens. I mean, you could, but it's gonna take forever to get down to you know, Plano. So um, you know, if you're starting out, I would say you wanna start with a minus two to minus four sphere would be ideal. I would say no more than 0.75 silk to start with. Once you get a little bit more familiar, you can do up to uh, one and a half diopters of silk with the rule. You want to really wait to start doing against the rule until you become more experienced. But tra traditionally speaking, I would say minus three to minus four. You can either, if you have a sphere, minus five is really not, um, you know, a lot different. But some doctors don't feel comfortable doing more, anything more than minus five. And then we lead into daily disposable multifocals. Um, I'm very excited because I actually was able to attend the launch event here in Miami back in January. So I did my training with my site um, at the event, which is great because you know I didn't have to like do it um, with uh, virtually with all the videos. So that was amazing. I was really excited, but then I hit a roadblock because I'm in Walmart and they do not have have not set up any way to sell that lens through walmart so we had to go through lots of hoops to be able to get the um 
the set. So I actually just got it last week and um, I can't wait to start. So the, the only thing with the my site is that right now the, it only corrects, corrects up to minus six diopters of myopia. And um, you know, you have to, you, do, you can do spherical equivalence. So if the patient has up to one diopter of astigmatism, you should be okay. Equipment, um, you're gonna need actually not a lot. You need everything that you have already in your office. And if you are doing ortho K, a topographer is a must. Now, if you don't have a topographer, you could find someone who has a topographer and send your patients to that office to get topographies and come back to you. But to do ortho K efficiently and effectively, you really should have a topographer. Um, and also, like Brianna said, if you are going to have, um, if you are going to be doing myopia control, you really should have a way to measure axial length. So an A scan is actually not very expensive. It's a nice little portable device. I like that one because I move around three different offices. So it was very convenient for me to carry it with me. And it's repeatable, it's easy to use, and um, the results are reliable. So, Dr. Um, Glenda? Which I had some people ask me this week, which topographers you recommend? So I recommend the MedMont. The MedMont, the reason why it is the gold standard for ortho K, um, because a lot of the softwares and a lot of the companies that design contact lenses, when you call them, their system is integrated with the MedMont. So they have the software that designs with that, uh, with that topographer. I think some of them are now using Oculus, but just most of the designs of Ortho K are the softwares are compatible with the amendment. So I think, you know, in the future is probably gonna change. Like Topcon has a new uh, device, which is really nice because it has a topographer and an axial length uh, measurement device in once and it really I had it in my office for a little bit and it was really nice because you only had to save time because you only have to sit the patient once so what I tell my friends and colleagues who call me and ask me this is if you are going to be doing negative five and less and you're not going to be doing a lot of cylinder and you know you're going to stick to those safe cases I think you'll be fine with using any topographer the oculus uh, you can use um, the Topcon Aladdin. They were going to call it here Maya, but I heard that they couldn't get the name here in the U.S. So they are coming out with um, a new myopia control model that is going to, basically the price is going to be better because now it doesn't have all the IOL cal calculations in it. So it's, I think that is going to be a great product. And if you are not going to be doing really high complicated cases, then um, you should be fine with the Oculus or with the um, Topcon Aladdin. But if you are doing really high cases, then you definitely need to get the midmont. So here is a picture of my patient. And um, this is the A, the a scan that I have, the ScanMate. Oh, where did I go? And that's the midmont. So the MedMan is a little bit harder to get because it comes really, really close to the eye. So, you know, sometimes it's hard to get it with the little kids, but my techs are amazing at it. They, you know, I've never had um, an instance when they couldn't get it on, on a child. And I see very little, a lot of little kids. So when to refer. So if you are, you know, an amazing clinician, you love ocular disease, and you do not like doing pediatric exam, that's when you need to refer your pediatric myopic patients. Um, you don't feel comfortable doing myopia control for one reason or another. I worked with um, another colleague in New York side by side, and she was like, there is no way I'm putting a contact lens, a hard lens on any children's cornea. She just did not feel comfortable at all doing that. So, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, but she didn't have a problem having someone else do it, she just didn't feel comfortable doing it herself. So that's when you, you know, you have this conversation with the parents and you, you know, refer them to someone who loves doing ortho okay. um, Patient shows pattern of a typical myopia progression. So you have your, you know, typical myopia progression, which they're progressing as, um, you know, predicted. They're increasing half diopter 
um, every year and they do not have a high risk of becoming really, really high myopic. So they're your low minus 50, minus one, anything less than minus two, and they don't have high risk characteristics. As Brianna mentioned, uh, parents are not myopic. Their axial length are, you know, is still very, very moderate. So those patients you would want to keep. But when you have these patients who have high risk, both parents have high myopia. Um, parents have history of retinal detachments. They have really long axial length. That's when you need to be referring those patients. Uh, let me see if I, oh, okay. And again, I think I already said this. If it is out of your comfort zone, you should really be referring that patient. Again, um, you know, some can argue you can do ortho -K without a topographer, but it's like treating glaucoma without a OCT and without a visual field. It's like, you're just, okay, I know you have glaucoma because I can see it on the slit thumb. You have really large caps, so I'm gonna give you this drops. But, you know, if you want to effectively manage, you really need to be, you know, doing OCTs. You wanna be taking pressures. You wanna be doing pechometry. So I would say, that wasn't me who came up with that analogy. It was a discussion on Facebook. I'm sure some of you saw it, but I thought it was a great comparison on why it's important to have the proper equipment so we can manage these patients um, correctly. So, you know, if we can't, I took this from the business course that I'm taking right now. And in business, they said, if you can't measure it, you cannot manage it. And I think that applies to myopia control very well. So we should be able to measured so that we can manage properly and we can really do the best thing for the patients. So I have a case to present to you. Um, and I have to say that I have um, three doctors that are here today that refer me patients all the time, whether it's for ortho or for scleral lenses. Um, so this was a patient that was referred to me by ASIFA. Uh, she's in a target and she sends me ortho patients all the time. This patient, he's, um, he wasn't very happy here, but he's actually a very, very good kid. I love him. He's a lot of fun and very, very smart. So he's 10 years old. His mom, both parents have myopia. His mom is like minus five. His dad is minus seven. His dad had a retinal detachment at age 11 and he's blind in that eye. This child's uh, prescription, when he came to me, he was a minus seven, minus 50 on the right, minus 675 minus 75 on the left. And the good thing is that he had good case. So his case are ideal for um, ortho -K treatment. So here are his topo, and this is why having a topographer is so important. So if you see on the top, we have the right and the left corneas. This is before treatment. And then at the bottom, we have his corneas one week after ortho -K. And I was actually, he was highly responsive. I was not expecting this, um, but he actually got to 2020 within a week. So that was amazing. So this was his VAs, his cornea was perfect. And, you know, he was static because I had already prepared them. I was like, you know, he's probably gonna take three weeks, you know, I don't know, maybe a month or so to get him all the way down to 2020 when he won't have to wear anything during the day. And in a week, he was actually free of correction. So he was very happy that he didn't have to wear any glasses. So here I'm going to talk now about um, my new project, my new dream. So I love working with Gianni and Brianna because they're just so brilliant. And like Gianni said, Brianna has so much energy. I'm like, I don't know where she gets it from. But every time I'm like, oh, I'm so tired. And then I get a text from Gianni. I'm like, what are you doing? And they're always going, these two ladies, oh my God. And they're always doing so much that I had this idea uh, about a year and a half ago. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. But just seeing Brianna and Gianni and seeing their energy and seeing everything that they do and pursuing their dreams and you know being doctors, but also doing other things on the side and creating companies. I was like, oh my God, they are amazing. So they really are my inspiration. Um, this is a little background on what inspired me to do myopia control. So like I said before, because I really enjoy working with children and children have myopia, um, but also because I wanted my practice to be different. Um, I wanted my practice to 
you know, have a competitive advantage of, over, you know, every other OD next to me. So my first patient who really inspired me to do myopia was a 16-year-old African-American um, boy who had lost his left eye at age 10 because he had a retinal detachment. He also had glaucoma. He had an IOL implant that did not go well. So he lost his eye completely. And when I saw him, he was minus 16 on his right eye. So he really, you know, when I saw this, it's like, okay, you learn it in school, you see it on the statistics, you see pictures, but when you have it sitting there, and this is a 16 year old, and I have, you know, my daughter is his age or was his age at that time. I was like, oh my God, it, it really like, that struck me. And that's when I was like, I need to start really, really getting into myopia control. Like before I was doing, you know, a few cases of ortho K here and there, but once I saw him, I, that's when, it really like drive me to to just want to do everything so before i was just doing ortho k but when i saw him i was like i need to do everything because what happens about to these kids who are not doing ortho k so that's when i decided that i wanted to be the top myopia control doctor in south florida i was like i had this illusion that i was going to see every patient in south florida and then reality kicked in and I realized that I couldn't do that because that's no way possible to do it. So that's when, you know, I went to Vision by Design with Brianna and other local ODs and we came back from there. We're all pumped up. But then I have a lot of my friends who went with us to the Vision by Design conference, but they came back and they had all this information about myopia control. Like you guys tonight, you're going to go home and you're like, oh my God, this was great. And then they, um, they were like, what do I do now? So that's when I have my Eureka moment, which it all started by helping friends like Gianni, Dr. Van, Dr. Medina. And I decided that, you know, instead of trying to see every patient in South Florida, which was not possible, not a viable option, um, I really wanted, I really am passionate about myopia control and it's not about me doing it, but helping others to do it and implement it into their practices. So that's when I came up with the idea on working on something so I can help other of these like yourself start doing myopia control in your practices. So tonight it's a little early. It's not our actually, you know, um, we're actually planning to have a big launch, but you guys get a sneak peek of our new company. Um, my business partner is Ralph Bojuli. He's here on the call. And I would love to introduce you guys our new company, which is OK Love, Myopia Control Experts. And what we, our mission is to provide local ODs. And I mean, I even have doctors from other states calling me to provide them with the tools and all the resources necessary to be successful at incorporating myopia control into your practices. So here is our email, here's my phone number. Um, feel free to text me if you like more information and there will be more to come. But thank you, Gianni, for giving me the opportunity to be here tonight. And I'm so excited to see um, a lot of friends and doctors that, you know, send me patients all the time. We co-manage patients. So that's awesome. Um, and Ralph is here. I don't know if you guys can see him. Yes, we can but uh, we're very excited. Um, the, I actually have my first client here, Natalie Finletter. She's Yay. here and she was our first client that signed up, so. Yes, and I'm so excited. <laughs> and you know, I wanna take also this opportunity to thank Loretta um, that created the Optometry Divas because um, it brought me to Glenda. And um, you know, I, who you, in one of my slides, I, one of my favorite quote, quotes is about who you connected, who you're connected to is so important. It really, really is important because that opens different doors, opportunities, and it's a support, support system. So I can't believe that we like jam packed all that information into the time that we did. And honestly, we only went 15 minutes over and almost everybody stayed, even though I gave them the, don't worry, you can get out if you want to. I know we have kids. Maybe we have, we're like on, on background, but I'm still like super excited that we had so many people that are interested in helping our patients with myopic control and making our practices unique so that, you know, we don't have to worry about the online companies and 1-800 um, contacts and 
and you know and we have all this information now about you know okay love which is a great system and um, i'm looking forward to being one of those um, clients and uh, dr rihanna for helping us learn about atropine and dr contact lens which you know i've seen that system from the beginning and what she's been doing as people support and and purchase that product all she keeps doing is putting more and more into it to make our lives and our profit margins go up our, our lives better and our prop, our profit margins go up so now i'm going to take the opportunity to if you guys need to go it's okay go ahead um don't forget to check out the chiasm news page for a continuing education hour also if you want to schedule a demo or um, if you want to start using your platform to send referrals, that would be awesome. You know, chat, co-manage with another OD, check out which ophthalmologists are there, invite other people to join the platform. I promise you that as we grow, I'm just going to keep doing the same thing as Brianna. I'm putting more and more to make our lives easier, to grow our practice and get more patients. I'm going to go ahead and open the floor to whoever wants to hang out for the After Hours Club. And um, that's right. There's a club still, it's just, there's no music and there's no drinks. At least there's only water. But- um, Come to the Divas event. That would be that's very right. fun. Um, so if anybody has any questions to ask uh, Dr. Rihanna Rue and Dr. Glenda Aleman, now's your chance. You could go ahead and unmute yourself or you could put it in the chat box if you don't wanna be heard. I'm just gonna ask one question. Uh, Glenda, you're in a Walmart, right? That's right. And in East Hialeah, right? Yep. Uh, what's the range that you charge for Ortho K? Are we allowed to ask that? Oh, sure. I have no problem um, um, sharing my prices with anyone. I try to keep it very competitive because when I started doing my OP control, um, you know, I, I was telling older orthokeratologists, they're like, oh my God, you're going to bring down the value of ortho -K. Like, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Don't do that. It's supposed to be only for private practice. So I actually charge, I have three tiers for ortho -K, and I charge between 1800 for my level one ortho -K to 3500 Oh my gosh. How many glasses do I have to sell to make that? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's really, you know, and I don't, I don't feel bad because, you know, I know that I'm doing something great for these kids. And when you think about it, you know, when I went to take my kids to the dentist, they're like, okay, so uh, your child is going to need braces. So, um, you know, we're going to go ahead and set up an appointment with the orthodontist. So I think that why we can't do that. And I think I saw a little short clip on Facebook and it's like dentists do this all the time, which is true. And, you know, they don't even give you the option to think about it and think about it. I mean, you know, you have a whole bunch of teeth, but we only have two eyes. So 